and hello everyone. Um, my name is Diana Bartone, Senior Food Security Analyst covering Somalia and the Horn of Africa region on the DC side of our early warning team. And I'm joined today presenting by my colleague Beth Weeks, also Senior Food Security Analyst and the Lead Analyst for Ethiopia on our DC team. Um, and we're looking forward to sharing with you today our Horn of Africa Food Security Outlook uh, briefing for the period of October 2023 to May 2024. So thanks again for joining at this early hour for many of us. Today, we'll start with our key messages for the presentation and then provide an overview of our analysis for the Greater Horn of Africa region, which will include current situation updates, our key assumptions for the projection period, and then our projected food security outcomes in the most likely scenario. And then we'll take a more in-depth look at the analysis for our countries of highest concern Ethiopia and Somalia. So our key messages, currently significantly above average rainfall during the region's late 2023 rainy season is supporting crop and livestock production, um, which is contributing to gradual recovery from the historic five season drought that affected the Eastern Horn from 2020 to 2023. However, in many areas affected by heavy rainfall and flooding as a consequence of this rainfall, people are contending with disruptions to their livelihoods, including but not limited to displacement, inundated farmlands, constrained access to markets and humanitarian assistance, and increased risk of human and livestock diseases. Now, in the October 2023 to January 2024 period, Poor households will overall benefit from seasonal access to food and income from agricultural labor, livestock milk production, and the beginning of harvesting in some areas. However, households are still recovering from the historic drought and face low livestock holdings, high levels of debt, and above average food prices. Uh, and as such, we expect stressed IPC phase two and crisis IPC phase three outcomes will persist across must, much of the Eastern Horn despite seasonal improvements. And in this period, emergency outcomes are anticipated in the worst conflict and drought affected areas of northern, southern, and southeastern Ethiopia, flood affected riverine areas of Somalia, and several settlements hosting flood and conflict displaced people in Somalia. And there is concern for populations in catastrophe, IPC phase five, in these areas of Ethiopia. Now in the February to May 2024 period, further recovery is expected due to improved access to food from late 2023, early 2024 harvests, as well as from agricultural labor and livestock milk production beginning in the next season in March, April. And in riverine areas of Somalia, food and income associated with above average off-season crop production, including harvests in March, April, is expected to drive improvement to crisis outcomes following the period of most severe uh, flood impacts prior. However, emergency outcomes are expected to persist in northern, southern, and southeastern areas of Ethiopia and some displacement settlements in Somalia where household food and income will remain very low. So now our current situation updates for the region. We'll start with looking at a simplified seasonal calendar for the East Africa region. I'll note that the current situation period for our October food security outlook analyses is um, October. However, during this presentation, we'll be sharing November updates as well to ensure that everyone has the most current information, particularly during this critical time in the midst of the October to December um, short rain season shown in blue. Now, cumulative rainfall to date, as most people are aware, in the October to December rainy season has been significantly above average, as was forecast, driven by prevailing El Nino and positive Indian Ocean dipole conditions. And you can see in the map on the left that as of the end of November, cumulative rainfall totals exceeded 200% or even 300% of normal, um, which is the blue colors in large portions of southeastern Ethiopia, northeastern Kenya, and southern Somalia. And the map on the right is showing that as of the end of November, these rainfall amounts are enough to make the season the wettest or second or third wettest on record across much of these areas as well. 
And on an, a positive note, the ample rainfall is having overall favorable impacts on crop and livestock production across the region. You can see here vegetation conditions have dramatically improved relative to average levels between the end of October, which is the map on the left, and the end of November, which is the map on the right, given the rainfall um, received in, in the period leading up to um, the end of November. And rangeland resources for livestock have uh, thusly improved across the region, and this is expecting to be expected to be supporting typical livestock migration patterns, improved livestock body conditions, and livestock reproduction and milk production, providing pastoralist and agro-pastoralist households with some improved access to food and income. On the other hand, heavy rainfall and flooding are having notable negative impacts on households access to food and income in affected areas of Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And in Somalia, flooding has been mainly concentrated in southern riverine areas as well as low-lying agro-pastoral areas, mostly in the southern and central regions, as you can see uh, shown on this map. And as of December 3rd, um, in terms of impacts, UN OCHA reports based on early needs assessments um, that over 1 million people are expected to have been displaced, um, which is a very large amount. And 41,000 hectares of land have been inundated, including a significant share of farmland in worst affected riverine and agro-pastoral areas. Um, in the Juba region, an estimated 155 uh, 1,000 plus livestock have been reported dead. Information is somewhat limited elsewhere. And suspected cases of waterborne diseases have already been reported in several locations. OCHA does estimate that assistance from humanitarians and other actors, including local communities, has been provided to over 800,000 people, but needs exceed the reach. Now in Ethiopia, flooding has mainly affected southern and southeastern areas with the Somali region uh, notably worse, worse affected. Um, as of November 27th, around 613,000 people have been displaced. A significant 171,000 hectares of crops have been reported damaged and more than 20,000 livestock have perished. Flooding is also reportedly exacerbating the ongoing cholera outbreak in the Somali and Deirdawa regions. In Kenya, flooding has mostly affected uh, northern and eastern, northeastern areas with around 136,000 people estimated to have been displaced as of somewhat earlier in November and November 19th. Flooding has also damaged crops and infrastructure and is raising the risk of waterborne diseases, as is the case elsewhere. And according to OCHA, humanitarian partners are working with the government to respond to the floods. And in this response, they've reached close to 1 million people in affected counties with food assistance. Meanwhile, in Uganda and Burundi, the extent of flooding and the severity of impacts have been more comparatively limited. In Uganda, locally heavy rains in late October caused flood, flood prone areas in the north uh, to be inundated with flood waters, resulting in displacement, crop damage, and minor destruction to infrastructure. However, uh, the damage has not been significant to change expectations for approximately average crop production at the national level overall. And in Burundi, localized areas across the country have been affected by flooding and landslides that have destroyed crops and infrastructure. You can see the destruction um, in the picture here on the slide. Um, and this includes houses, public infrastructure, bridges, roads, et cetera. However, similarly, upcoming season C crop production is expected to be average overall. Now, at this time of year leading up to the harvest, most poor households remain highly dependent on markets for most of their food. And so the fact that staple cereal prices are mostly above average across the region, as you can see in these maps, which show maize prices in October compared to five-year average levels on the left and the same for uh, sorghum prices on the right, um, this fact that staple cereal prices are mostly above average is currently a key constraint on poor households' access to food. 
even so it's worth noting um and we have just changed slides i know they look very similar but it's worth noting that staple cereal prices have declined relative to the peak levels recorded during the drought last year um and the declines have been recorded in uganda kenya and much of somalia so these maps are showing prices compared to the same time last year however prices remain higher than last year as you can see in ethiopia and burundi Now, pastoralist households are also highly dependent on markets for their food, and even more so than typical for this time of year because of below average access to milk that is resulting from the fact that households still have herd sizes that are much below uh, normal levels following the impacts of the historic drought. And while livestock prices are near average to above average across most of the region, as you can see, um, in this map of goat prices compared to average in October 2023. Most poor pastoralist households cannot earn even their typical income from livestock sales due to the low livestock holdings and the need to rebuild their herds. But even among those who can sell some livestock, above average cereal prices are generally counteracting any benefits of above average livestock prices with overall purchasing power below average in most pastoral areas of Somalia and Ethiopia, and in several areas of Kenya as depicted in the chart on this slide, though in Kenya, trends in purchasing power are mixed compared to the average. Again, though worth emphasizing that most poor households face low livestock holdings and high cereal prices despite any um, above average purchasing power. Similarly, for poor households dependent on agricultural labor, above average staple cereal prices are generally driving below average purchasing power in Ethiopia and Kenya, despite prevailing above average wage rates. However, in Somalia, the trend is slightly different with purchasing power generally near or above five-year average levels, given above average wage rates combined with mixed trends in cereal prices compared to the average. Finally, conflict remains another key driver of acute food insecurity in the region, particularly in Ethiopia and Somalia. Given dis population displacement, disruptions to population movement, including for trade and livelihood activities, and hindered humanitarian access. And this graph shows the number of conflict events that have occurred monthly in Ethiopia, broken down by region. And you can see here that conflict recently escalated in August and September 2023 to reach levels not seen since late 2021. And this recent conflict has been concentrated uh, primarily in Ampara and Oromia regions. Meanwhile, across the rest of the country, including in Tigray, levels of conflict remain relatively low. Meanwhile, in Somalia, sustained levels of conflict continue to primarily affect southern and central areas of the country. However, the comparatively recently escalated conflict in the northwestern Sula region around Las Canud town um, and the rest of the region remains of highest concern. Looking forward through May 2024, the key aspects of seasonality to note are that harvesting will be occurring through around February in much of the region. And in March, April, the next main rainy season and agricultural season will commence. And so with that, these are our key assumptions used to build the most likely scenario for acute food insecurity in this period. Late 2023 rainy seasons are generally expected to be characterized by above average cumulative rainfall and surprisingly at this point and rainfall in December is also forecast to be significantly above average. And you can see the December forecast uh, on this map here. And while flooding is anticipated to continue in December, river stream flows are anticipated to decline seasonally following this, gradually reducing risk of flooding. Continuing the assumptions, crop production in late 2023, early 2024 is expected to be generally average to above average in most areas supported by the ample rainfall. However, in Ethiopia, Somalia, and in the Unimodal Karamoja region of Uganda, crop production is expected to be below average. Staple cereal prices are expected to follow seasonal trends, declining alongside local harvests 
before increasing again throughout the rest of the projection period. Prices are expected to remain above average, but near or below last year's levels in most areas. In pastoral areas of the Eastern Horn, livestock prices are anticipated to remain near or above average levels, except for in parts of Ethiopia where livestock body conditions are expected to decline, driving down value. Humanitarian assistance um, is expected to be scaled up in Ethiopia beginning in 2024, given the lifting of the pause of assistance, but humanitarian assistance is expected to be scaled down in Somalia. However, flood affected populations across the region will likely be assisted during periods of high need. Finally, conflict and insecurity will continue with highest levels in Somalia and Ethiopia. In the October to January period, poor households are expected to benefit from seasonal improvements in access to food and income from labor opportunities and livestock production during the remainder of the rainy season and the parallel agricultural season. However, rural households in drought affected areas of the Horn, again, are still recovering herd sizes and assets and are still repaying accumulated debts. So given this slow recovery combined with the prevailing above average market prices, Many poor households are expected to continue to struggle to meet their basic needs in the October to January period with stressed IPC phase two and worse outcomes expected to, main, to remain widespread across the Eastern Horn and in Karamoja, Uganda. In Ethiopia, crisis and emergency outcomes are expected to persist in Northern, Southern and Southeastern areas given impacts of prior and ongoing conflict, lasting impacts of the historic drought in the pastoral South and Southeast, recent impacts of flooding and limited seasonal improvement due to below average mahair crop production. In Somalia, crisis outcomes are expected to persist in many pastoral and agro-pastoral areas that experienced negative impacts on um, crop and livestock production due to an atypically hot and dry July to September Haga season on top of the lasting drought impacts. Emergency IPC phase four outcomes, though, are expected in riverine areas worst affected by flooding, IDP settlements in areas worst affected by conflict and flooding, and in the badly drought affected coastal day pastoral livelihood zone of the central region. In Kenya, crisis outcomes are expected to persist in drought affected areas of the north and east amid above average staple food prices. Meanwhile, relatively better outcomes are expected in Uganda and Burundi, which typically receive higher rainfall amounts and were not as hard hit by drought in recent years. In the February to May period, further improvement is expected in most of the region. However, by early 2024, emergency outcomes are expected to spread in northern Ethiopia, where crop production was very poor, especially in Tigray as households exhaust their food stocks amid exceptionally high food prices and low income generating opportunities. In Somalia, crisis outcomes will likely persist in the February to May period in northern areas worst affected by prior seasons of poor crop production, as well as in central areas worst affected by the 2020 to 2023 drought and riverine areas affected by flooding during the dare season. Meanwhile, in IDP settlements, crisis and emergency outcomes will be likely given low levels of assistance and the continued influx of displaced households due to ongoing flooding and conflict. And throughout both of these projection periods, refugee settlements of Uganda are expected to face crisis outcomes due to limited livelihood opportunities and above average prices amid comparatively lower levels of humanitarian assistance compared to prior points in time. And I'll hand the presentation over to Beth for the Ethiopia Area of Concern section. Good morning, everyone. Next slide, Diana. And I'm going to cover the early 2023 rainfall seasons, which were generally favorable. However, when we started to see the June to September seasons, which are the Kerempt, Karan, and Karma seasons, we saw increasing precipitation or rainfall deficits within Ethiopia. And this map on the left is showing rainfall as a percent of normal from June 1 to September 30th, with those dark orange to red colors indicating larger precipitation deficits. Now, drought conditions at the end of the season ranged from moderate to exceptional drought, 
predominantly in southwestern, northern, northern, and northwestern areas, as well as well as along the Rift Valley and northern pastoral areas. However, we did see a typical rainfall continue in October and November, as you can see on the chart here on the right. And with the atypical rainfall that we saw late in the season, while the harvest was ongoing, we did see some yield reductions as well in because of this late season rainfall. Now, overall total mahair production, which is the production that comes from predominantly the Karemt, Karma, and Quran seasons in Ethiopia, which starts in October and runs through early January, is expected to be below average despite the relatively favorable rainfall that we saw in surplus producing Western Ethiopia. Overall, the cropping season was distributed by the drought during the Karemt season below normal access to agriculture inputs, localized instances of flooding, pest damage, crop disease, and conflict. Next slide, please. Now, Diana covered conflict in Ethiopia, so I'm not going to dive significantly into that, as well as she also covered in detail the ongoing October to December rainfall season. So I won't be covering that in significant detail here. Now, taking a look at displacement, now the map on the left is showing the internally displaced population represented as a percent of the total population by Worida. This is based on IOM data that was released in June. In this release, they noted that over 4.3 million people were internally displaced nationally, with conflict and drought being the primary drivers for this displacement. And overall, we see that the most displaced people are concentrated within Tigray, Amhara, Oromia, and Somali regions. Now, since June, it is likely that we've seen a moderate increase in the number of displaced populations as the continued conflict as well as flooding have outpaced the number of people returning to their areas of origin. Now, in Northern Ethiopia, where we have ongoing conflict in Amhara, we are seeing there are both longer term displaced households who were dis displaced during the 2020 2022 conflict in Tigray, as well as recently displaced households due to the uptick of conflict that we've seen in areas of Amhara. And in the pastoral south and southeast, displacement remains high with over 2.3 million people displaced in Oromia and Somali regions, with few return, return households taking place as well as continued displacement due to flooding. Now, Ethiopia also hosts a significant number of refugees from its neighbors. Most recently, we've seen an influx of refugees to Ethiopia from Sudan. The map on the left is showing the movement from Sudan to Ethiopia as of November 15th, where we see nearly 40,000 people who have arrived from Sudan. Most of those Sudanese refugees, as well as most refugees within Ethiopia, live within displacement camps or among host communities. And those who live within displacement camps have recently started receiving assistance as the pause of assistance was lifted earlier for the re refugee population than it has been for the rest of the population. Next slide, please. Now, as Diana noted, the food prices in Ethiopia remain extremely elevated. The map on the left is showing maize prices compared to the three-year average across key markets in the country. And on, you can see just how high prices are, and they range up from 26 to over 150% above average. And taking a look at price trends of maize in Addis, you can see that in 2023, we have seen prices just continue to rise and remain elevated. Now in conflict affected Amhara and Tigray, food prices also remain high due to the limited supply and elevated demand in those areas. And in the Somali region, cereal sh supply shortages are occurring due to disrupted trade flows and the pause of humanitarian distribution food aid distributions, which are reported to be diverted and sold in local markets, and also the decline in locally produced food staples. There is concern for wheat and sorghum availability 
in areas of highest concern in the south and southeast, including Afdar, Liban, Shabeli, and Khoury zones. Next slide, please. Now taking a look at income sources, the map on the right or sorry the left here is showing the change in price of one goat compared to the three-year average in key modern markets and overall livestock prices have are also elevated and remain above average in most key markets however we have not seen livestock prices keep pace with those of food prices and while We've seen the improvements in livestock body conditions. That is also helping to drive the increase in livestock prices in the South and Southeast. Now, specifically in the South and Southeast and one representative market, which is Chiretti, the terms of trade are about 10% below average in September. So that's the amount of grain a sheep can buy or a goat sorry a goat can buy um for a household now a single sheep or sorry a single goat can buy about 45 kgs of maize which is sufficient to feed a household for seven for about 11 days now also as diana noted but you can see here illustrated on the map which is the terms of trades so the amount of one what one day wage rate can buy for maize in Ethiopia is well below average. Now we've seen nationally that wage rates have increased compared to 2022, as well as the three-year average in most markets. And this is mostly due to inflationary pressures on the market. However, in most markets, wage rates have not kept pace, kept pace with food prices, similar to that of livestock prices. And we have seen that the amount of maize a household is able to purchase with a day's late Wage, labor wage is below normal. Next slide, please. So taking a look at the seasonal calendar for Ethiopia and some of the key events that are going to be occurring in our projection period. So in cropping and agropastoral areas of most of Western, Northern and Central Ethiopia, the Meher harvest will continue through early January with the harvest first ending in the north and then will wrap up in the south as the harvest begins in the north and slowly proceeds southern to the south. And then in bimodal or belg receiving areas of Ethiopia, we'll see belg planting and then the belt followed by the belg rains begin in early 2024. Now in the pastoral areas, both in the northern and southern pastoral areas, the lean season will begin in early 2024, which will be followed by the March to May rainy season. Also in the south and southeast, we will see the Dare and Haggai season wrap up in the next couple weeks. Next slide, please. So looking at our key assumptions for Ethiopia, in the south and southeastern pastoral areas, above average rainfall is expected for the October to December rainfall with continued heavy rainfall into December. This, as we've seen already high levels of flooding, we anticipate that those high levels of flooding are expected to persist through at least December in the pastoral south and southeast. Now in the Meher producing areas of the country, Notably in Northern Ethiopia, we do expect that household food stocks from the harvest will most likely begin to be exhausted in early 2024. Generally, macroeconomic conditions will remain poor nationally, driven by, oh, associated with the elevated inflation rate we are expecting. Food prices are likely to remain well above average throughout the projection period. We do expect some modest declines as the Meher harvest continues from October through January. And then we expect prices to increase in February through at least May as we see household demand increase on the market as well as supply decline. FUSENET anticipates that PSMP is likely to begin in early 2024 throughout the country besides in Tigray. In Tigray, the systems that are needed in place for 
distribution of PSMP are still be are still becoming functional and is not expected that PSMP will occur. Additionally, this scenario assumes that humanitarian food distributions will most likely gradually increase to reach about 3.2 million people in early by early 2024. Next slide, please. So taking a look at FuseNet's projections for Ethiopia. On the left here, we're looking at October 2023 to Janu January 2024. Now, many areas of the country are expected to face minimal or stressed outcomes supported by the consumption of own produced foods from the Meher harvest. However, emergency and crisis outcomes are most likely in areas where conflict and drought have severely eroded household livelihoods and limited coping capacity among many poor households. FuseNet expects high levels of acute food insecurity and acute malnutrition, as well as the possibility of hunger-related deaths in the south and southeast, as well as areas of Afar and northeastern Amhara. Now, as we look to the February to May 2024 period, we expect food security conditions to decline in central, northern, and western areas of the country, where household food stocks are expected to decrease faster than normal given the below average mahair harvest and households becoming increasing market reliant amid high and increasing food prices. Conversely, improvement is expected in the south as largely favorable seasons support slow recovery from the drought. And we expect that we will see further milk production as cattle, camels, and goats are expected to give birth in many areas of the south and southeast. And I believe I hand it back over to Diana. Thank you, Beth. So now we'll take a look at our analysis for Somalia in a little more detail. Alongside the ongoing October to December dare rainy season, poor households are currently earning some income from typical seasonal land preparation and planting activities, except in the worst flood affected areas. And at this time as well, pastoral households are migrating their livestock to wet season grazing areas and benefiting from seasonally high levels of milk production in November. Now, looking back to earlier in 2023, the April to June 2023 Gu rainy season brought much re needed relief from the drought conditions of the prior five seasons. However, as you can see, shown in the map on the left, cumulative rainfall was still below average in during the Gu in South Central Somalia, and a late season dry spell negatively impacted Gu crop production somewhat more widely. And because of the production losses and the need that poor households had to sell much of their harvests to repay debts, Gu cereal stocks were exhausted atypically early this year. Following the goose season, the July to September Haggad dry season was even more hot and dry than usual. And you can see the below average rainfall during that period illustrated in the map on the right. And the currently ongoing dare season has again proven to be exceptionally wet with cumulative rainfall more than 150% of normal across most of the country shown in green and exceeding 200 and even 300% of normal in many areas, especially in the Southern and Central regions. And the graph on the right is showing rainfall amounts received over time per five day period in by region, which is largely agro-pastoral. And you can see that the dare season generally started on time in October with rainfall picking up in mid-October and with episodes of exceptionally heavy rainfall during October and November. And given the slow start to the season in October, vegetation conditions remained mixed as of the end of October shown on the left with below average conditions prevailing in some of the worst drought affected central pastoral areas which continued to hinder recovery of livestock body conditions. However, as of the end of November, shown on the right, vegetation conditions have improved in most areas and are now significantly above average across much of the country, supporting the livestock sector with improved rangeland resources. 
And the rainfall is also generally supporting crop production activities, though many areas that have been inundated by exceptionally heavy rainfall and flooding have experienced water logging and disruptions to the season that are ultimately likely to drive reduced production levels. Riverine areas of Somalia typically experience the highest flood risk and greatest level of flooding. And on this slide, we're looking at monitoring of water levels in the Juba and Shabele rivers. The map on the left is showing monitored river stations and the graph on the right is showing trends in water levels in the Shabele River measured at the Bellatwain station, in the, which is the northernmost station in, um, on the Shabele River in Somalia. And I'll note that in the stations shown in green on the map, river water levels um, have only recently declined below moderate flood risk levels in late November, early December, alongside a dry period and could rise again rapidly. Meanwhile, in Bella Twain Station um, and the st other stations shown in red, um, river water levels are currently at bankful levels, which exceeds high flood risk levels. And in terms of impacts, with over 1 million people displaced to date, flood, flooding impacts have been severe in southern riverine as well as in low-lying agro-pastoral areas of the south. Flooding has destroyed homes and transportation infrastructure and is causing constraints um, to population movement that are disrupting trade and humanitarian access. As of late November, early December, ground information indicates that approximately 90% of riverine farmlands and over 40 to 60% of agro-pastoral farmlands across the southern regions affected by flooding have been inundated, um, which is impeding DARE 2023 cropping activities significantly, in turn limiting poor households' access to income from labor. However, the dry period that occurred in late November, a comparatively dry period, has a allowed for the start of off-season cultivation activities, which will improve households' access to agricultural labor opportunities and crop production um, in 2024. And while there has been a response from the humanitarian sector with nearly 500,000 people reached with food assistance in November, um, and with more funding released for the response in late November, needs continue to exceed reach. Now, looking at trends in staple cereal prices in a little bit more detail than what we discussed previously, you can see trends over time here in staple cereals and key reference markets of Somalia. And while prices are lower than the high levels recorded in 2022, there has been an uptick in prices in October, which has reportedly continued in November. And this is attributed to declining um, cereal market stocks, uh, given typical seasonal trends, but also due to loss of goo off-season harvests as a result of the devastating flooding. And um, a third factor is disruptions to transportation and trade due to the heavy rains and flooding, um, which affected supply to inland markets. And so this has brought prices farther above five-year average levels, further straining purchasing power for poor market-dependent households at this time of year. And at this time, uh, the provision of humanitarian food assistance does continue to be gradually scaled down as the impacts of the drought slowly subside. Currently, around 10% of the national population are being reached monthly with assistance, although the population in need is assessed to be more than 25% of the national population. Um, it's worth emphasizing that for many rural and displaced beneficiaries, particularly those living in displacement settlements, the continued provision of assistance remains key to preventing worse acute food insecurity outcomes. And looking forward to the projection period, I'll highlight that the main season dare harvest is expected in January, February. And the next main agricultural season will begin around April along the start of the Gu rains. I also want to highlight um, here with this red box the timing of the off-season dare crop production that I've mentioned several times at this point. This off-season production mainly occurs in riverine areas as floodwaters recede. And 
this um, seasonal production is key to our expectations for some recovery in food security in flood affected areas in the February to May period. Um, so you can see the 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 season um, will occur throughout the through the harvest, which will occur in March April. Now, looking forward to our projection period, our key assumptions include the following: cumulative rainfall in the October to December dare season is expected to be significantly above average, including in December. And risk of flooding is anticipated to remain elevated in December, um, though river stream flows are forecast to reduce beyond December. Cereal production in the main dare season is expected to be below average in Somalia due largely to the impacts of flooding and excessive soil moisture um, which is disrupting agricultural activities and damaging crops in affected areas. However, the off-season harvest in riverine areas is expected to be above average, supported by the high levels of soil moisture. Opportunities for agricultural labor will generally be disrupted during the main dare season <clears throat> in, affected, um, in areas affected by heavy rainfall and flooding, but will likely be above average beginning in December. Above average dare rainfall is also expected to support abundant pasture and water resources for livestock, in turn supporting livestock body conditions and milk production. Birth rates of small ruminants will likely be uh, medium to high during the dare. However, due to poor conceptions in previous seasons, birth rates of large ruminants will likely be low to medium in most areas and low in central pastoral regions. Um, and milk availability, though it will improve, is expected to remain below average in most areas due to the below average herd sizes faced by most households, except in some southern areas. Prices of staple cereals are expected to increase overall throughout the projection period and remain lower than last year, but above average levels in most areas. And similarly, livestock prices are expected to re remain above average but income from livestock sales will be below average, again, due to below average herd sizes. Humanitarian food assistance is expected to be further scaled down throughout the projection period, aside from in some high priority areas. And conflict is expected to persist near current levels, and this will continue to drive access constraints and population displacement. Um, let me just, I heard something, so let me just check on that. Okay. Thank you, Lark. Yep, so this is the, the last slide. Um, our projected food security outcomes starting first on the left in the October to January period. Most poor rural households will benefit from some seasonal access to food and income from agricultural labor, as well as seasonal livestock milk production during this time. However, again, rural households in drought affected areas are still recovering from, from the impacts of the drought um, and crisis outcomes are likely to persist given this as well as the impacts of the atypically hot and dry haga season on crop and livestock production. Additionally, flooding is anticipated to continue to disrupt the main agricultural season as well as other typical livelihood and trade activities in affected areas through at least December with households in many affected areas expected to continue to face food consumption gaps and crisis and emergency outcomes in the absence of assistance. Overall, emergency outcomes are expected in this period in riverine areas worst affected by flooding, as well as in settlements hosting displaced people affected by flooding and conflict, and in the badly drought affected coastal day pastoral livelihood zone in the central region of Somalia. Then in the February to May 2024 period, further recovery is anticipated in most areas as rural households will be benefiting from improved access to food from the main dare harvest in January, February, and then as well beginning in March, April from agricultural labor and livestock milk production as the next major rainy season commences. As such, many areas will likely see improvement to stressed outcomes. However, we expect that crisis outcomes will persist in northern areas worst affected by prior seasons of poor crop production, as well as in central areas worst affected by the historic drought. Meanwhile, in IDP settlements, crisis and emergency outcomes will be likely given low levels of assistance and a continued influx of displaced people due to flooding and conflict. 
However, in riverine areas affected by flooding during the dare season, outcomes are expected to improve to crisis, given that households in riverine areas of Somalia will benefit from off-season cultivation after the floodwaters recede, with the above-average harvest expected in March-April. And with that, uh, we would be very glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, everyone.